Good morning. It is April 1 and all the fools are on the Turf Team Times. We return this year with uh, a new edition and some of the old gold. Online today, we got Dr. Dave Gardner, we got Dr. Dave Shedder, we got Dr. Dominic Petrella. Welcome to the house. And the inimitable Pamela Sharat. Uh, today, leading us off, Dr. Dave Gardner with the weed update as we start into the year. All right. Good day everybody i guess i shouldn't say morning because you might not necessarily watch this during the morning time but uh wanted to spend just a couple of minutes talking about some things that you should think about during the month of april um one of them is winter annual weeds which depending on where you are they might look like this or if you're on a south facing slope or near a heat sink like a landscaping bed or concrete they might be further along maybe not necessarily blooming uh yet but if you have winter annual weeds try to control those before they flower and set seeds so that you might have less of a problem with them next year. Now that's kind of tricky because uh, some of our herbicides work fairly well in cooler weather and some of them do not. So if you're going to attempt to control winter annuals now, make sure that uh, on cooler days you're using ester formulations of the herbicide. If it's above 60 to 70 degrees, you can use the amine formulations, but remember in cooler weather, use those ester formulations or remember that there is this uh, active ingredient florazolam marketed as defender herbicide that um, the weed control spectrum is a little bit narrow with this product, uh, but the weeds that it controls are dandelion, white clover, and uh, the winter annuals. So if you have issues with winter annual weeds, uh, florazolam is a good choice, and this product is really, really good in cold weather. Something else that you might be seeing are these little patches of straw colored turf and almost invariably these are going to be either Bermuda grass or nimble will. Um, but if they're dormant, remember that there's nothing that you can do about them right now. Ultimately, you're going to have to wait until these green up in the month of May before you can use a non select herbicide to control them and then reseed or reset those areas. But where you see those patches this is a good time of year to at least get in your mind where they are um, because uh, you'll you'll be able to uh, you know, find them more easily when you go out to uh, attempt to control those in May. Um, again, non-selective herbicide is what you're going to have to use, glyphosate being the best choice because it is systemic, but don't bother trying to do anything now because glyphosate does not work particularly well on dormant uh, grasses. So you're going to have to wait until the month of May when soil temperatures are in the 70s. For crabgrass, we should all be thinking about putting down our pre-emergence herbicide. Depending on the active ingredient, um, you can wait a little while. So like if it's dithiopyr, for example, you can spray dithiopyr on um, crabgrass that's one to two leaf, but it's usually intended to be used as a pre-emergence herbicide. Point being that um, you know, now's about the time to be thinking about putting down your pre-emergence herbicide to control crabgrass. Um, some of the indicators that we use are when the two inch soil temperature reaches about 50 degrees or when forsythia is in bloom. So this plant here that's in bloom all over Columbus, right about the time that this finishes bloom and um, you're starting to see leaves on it, that's the optimal timing to put down a pre-emergent herbicide. You can put them down now, it's just, you know, sometimes we have things happen and you have herbicide breakdown that occurs. And so you, you know, if you put down the herbicide too early, you might not get as effective control later um, in the spring and early summer when crabgrass is still germinating. So again, if you're trying to optimize your crabgrass control, try to target that application for, you know, around April 15th. But again, the time that this shrub is finishing blooming and just starting to leaf out is, is a good time to do that. Um, which I guess I said all of that before putting up the text. My bad. It's the first of these of the year. I'm a little rusty. Okay. But that, Ed, is my update for this week. Thank you, Dave. And because of my poor editing skills, that will stay there. All right. Following that, Pamela Sharat. Good morning, everybody. Uh, it's great to be back on Turf Team Time. So um, I, my lawn and I've seen you know, sports fields driving around town. Everything's greening up nicely. Um, I have started to see sod for sale. Can always sod. Um, we might be a little bit too soon to seed, possibly. Uh, but in the next couple of weeks, should be thinking about it. With the way with the supply chain is right now, um, if you are looking to do considerable seeding on your athletic fields this spring, you probably should get hold of your seed supplier sooner rather than later, because there will be supply issues with some of the varieties perhaps that you wanted to get. 
Um, I had an interesting conversation with Dr. Leah Brillman this week. Uh, we were talking about organic, organic establishment of uh, bluegrass fields, actually. And because I've had Dr. Gardner and I have been involved with um, a couple of these scenarios in the last 12 months where um, communities are looking for organic ways to establish grass or manage fields. And uh, anyway, so she told me about this, this operation that they do over there where they, where they have the seed operation. Um, and between seed crops, they will grow a white mustard crop and they will till that into the soil. They will let it go to flower and then they will till it into the soil top five inches. Uh, so it's sort of a, a cover crop, if you will, adds organic material to the soil. And it also acts as an organic uh, biofumigant uh, to suppress weed seeds and insect pests like nematodes. So um, we had a little discussion before this and we don't know too many uh, refereed research papers on this subject, but I think it's worth investigation. Uh, it's, it's an interesting topic, I think, to, to think about, maybe do some investigation on. Um, I am seeing more and more, especially K through 12 facilities where they're looking for organic options. Uh, Dr. Gardner and I did do an article in, in February's Sports Field Managers Association magazine. I have to remember it's SFMA now, not STMA. In the SFMA February edition of my column, uh, Dr. Gardner and I uh, put together an organic weed control at establishment article. So you can you can go ahead and read that, um, and then just reach out. Uh, Dr. Gardner and I are happy to to work with you on organic options for establishment. That's it. That's all I have today, Dr. Ed. Thanks, Pam. All right, Dr. Shatter, you still got full army worms falling out of your ears. <laughs> Ah, where did my PowerPoint go? <laughs> Hold on for a second. Okay. Uh, Pam, just as Dave is searching for his PowerPoint um, from a seeding standpoint and sod, have you seen any activity there? I have not. Um, I know the sod, the sod producers are selling sod right now. Of course, you can sod whenever it's not, the ground, as long as the ground's not frozen. And actually, this is a nice time to do that because uh, we get timely spring rains because one of the reasons sod fails is that it, those edges dry out and they dry out, they get desiccated. So, um, yeah, I think we'll start to see a lot of seed operations going on in the next week or two. As these soils get up to 50 degrees, we'll start to see that um, coming up. And I can talk about that next week, too, or in the next 13 times. That is a good point. Soil temperatures up in the Cleveland area are about, uh, I think, 42 degrees, Tom, is where you are. And down here in Worcester, uh, we were at 44, 45. Is that right? We're running back and forth with the weather we've been getting. We've been up to 50 for one day, back down to 40 for the next couple of days. Right now, we're hovering in the low 40s. All a right. great resource, just a great resource for turf managers. If you Google OARDC weather stations, um, you can access your local weather station and it will tell you what your soil temperatures are, I believe, at two and four inches depth. That is true, Pam. The only thing to be aware of, folks, is that mowing height on that is not necessarily applicable to greens. Uh, so there's going to be variability there. And it is in uh, soil-based root zones, so don't take that as something for sand-based root zones. Um, all right, Dr. Shetler, we completely walked over your fall army. <laughs> that, no, that, that's perfectly okay. I, I actually wanted to start with that. Uh, I wanted to, to point out that uh, uh, there's uh, several entomologists because of the army worm outbreak last year that have pheromone traps out uh, th this year. And, and lo and behold, uh, one of them got an army worm uh, this last week with that storm front. And, and so while I've been predicting that we won't have any army worm infestations this year, uh, maybe I'll have to draw back on that. I know. That April, 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 April Fools. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think we're going to see Heidner here of, of, of Army Worm this year. So uh, enough about that. What I did want to co cover was the annual bluegrass weevil. Uh, it has become increasingly apparent that this pest is moving across Ohio. Uh, a, a lot of the movement is, is through uh, infested sod. Uh, where golf courses are doing renovations and, and so forth. So we've got to watch out now, especially on, on golf courses uh, for this annual bluegrass weevil. Just to show you some of the sites, we've always had major infestations uh, up here in, in the, the uh, 
northeastern quarter of the state, but we now know we've got a golf course here, several golf courses down in the Cincinnati area that have the annual bluegrass weevil, and, and they have been confirmed by the bug doc, uh, and, and also uh, uh, my colleague uh, from uh, Penn State, uh, Ben McGraw, has been over, and he's confirmed them also. What I really wanted to, to talk about, uh, Dave Gardner had mentioned about the forsythia. I find it kind of interesting. We use forsythia also to predict when the annual bluegrass weevil is up and moving around. And, and basically it starts moving around when the forsythia is in full bloom. But just like Dave said for the, the pre-emergent uh, uh, applications, when forsythia is what we say half green and half yellow, in other words, uh, the bloom is beginning to senesce, drop off, and, and the leaves are beginning to emerge. That's the time that we have the optimal movement of the annual bluegrass weevil uh, adults that have overwintered, typically in sheltered areas like woodlots uh, next to the, the uh, turf fairways and so forth. They become active, and they uh, continue through the time that redbud uh, is, is uh, evident. And so... That's kind of the window from when forsythia is senescing uh, and red buds become uh, in, in full bloom. Oops. Now, what does that uh, look like? Uh, if, you're, if you're thinking that that's the time, I always recommend going out with a detergent flush. Again, a couple of tablespoons of dishwashing detergent. Uh, Joy, uh, the, the uh, Ivory Clear and, and Dawn Ultra are the three detergents uh, that don't seem to have any phytotoxicity. <laughs> if you want to kill turf, uh, use palm olive. Uh, but uh, uh, some of these other detergents, a uh, couple of tablespoons uh, and, and a couple of gallons of water, uh, spread that over about a one square meter area. And, and very quickly, of course, if it's really cold today, you're doing this, the weevils are very slow to come up. But if it's a warmer day, like we had the other day of 70 degrees, they'll pop up uh, rather rapidly. Now I've got some superintendents that are up in the Northeastern area that have put out these linear pitfall traps. Uh, they've been dealing with annual bluegrass weevils uh, for a long time. And so they really wanna be very careful about how they monitor them. Uh, when the little weevils uh, come walking through the turf and they fall in the little slits, uh, they'll crawl around here and end up in a little bucket uh, at the end of that. But again, uh, I don't recommend everybody use those pitfall traps, but if, uh, if, if this is a major pest on your golf course, they certainly can help you in, in the monitoring uh, and detection of, of first movement of these. Dave, Next I thing quick, I, sorry, sure. on yeah. the trap, where is the best location to place that on the course? Yeah, that, uh, excellent. actually, that's an excellent question. It's really right there at the border of where the rough meets the fairway. Uh, and and uh, you could kind of put it in an inconspicuous space. Obviously, it's going to interfere a little bit with your mowing. You'll have to use a weed whipper around that. You can't mow right over the top of it. Uh, but uh, usually we, we prefer that maybe a, a meter to uh, two meters uh, away from the actual uh, fairway itself in the rough area is the best place to have that. <clears throat> I also wanted to point out... Uh, since we're getting these infestations in the more southern parts of Ohio, uh, there was a, a, a publication or a thesis that was published just this last year uh, by uh, Emmeline Daly, uh, who was doing some studies of annual bluegrass weevil uh, over in Virginia. And she did confirm three distinct generations. And, and this is gonna be problematic uh, because what we see in the northern part of Ohio is one, the, the, the initial first generation and then a second generation, but I haven't really confirmed a third generation there. But my feeling is, and uh, especially down in Cincinnati, you're in the same zone sort of uh, as, as having three generations. Uh, again, we recommend if you can knock out that first generation, generally you're pretty well cleaned up for the rest of the year. And while you might get partial uh, reproduction later on in the season, it's not enough to damage uh, your turf. When it comes to treatments, uh, again, timing is, is really important. Uh, I'm a real fan of the combination products, the Triple Crown and Aloft. These are, have seemed to be doing very well. Some of the superintendents that I work with up in the Cleveland area 
uh, are preferring aloft. They're making that their first aloft application when that forsythia is in that declining bloom. They use a half rate of the aloft, uh, and that seems to kill uh, the adult weevils that are migrating. Then about three weeks later, they apply the second half of their annual allotment of aloft, and that cleans up any straggling adults that emerge late, as well as because of the systemic activity of the clothianid and takes out any of the larvae that, that may have successfully uh, tried to get established in, in that term. Uh, again, for the curity, there's a whole bunch of these. If you need a rescue treatment, uh, clothianidin by itself is pretty good with that. And for instance, uh, the, the uh, anthrononic diamide that has curative activity, these appear to be the two top performers for those sort of curative controls when you realize that you've got some larvae, you want to clean those larvae up, even some larger larvae. Uh, we've got some other ones that are in, in the sort of in that mix, uh, but these have uh, a little bit less uh, activity. Okay, that's it. For the annual bluegrass weevil and my, hopefully my joke for the... Uh, uh, <laughs> Thanks, Dave. You got me for a second. All right, last but not least, the new man on the block returning to town, Dr. Dominic Petrella. Thanks, Ed. Yeah, Dominic Petrella here up at OSU ATI. Uh, first thing I'll share with you, my screen, uh, we talked about uh, soil temperatures. So right here in the middle, this these are current soil temperatures under a one and a half inch Kentucky bluegrass field at three inches. So when we installed these, we were 45 degrees. And you can see over the, the weird weather we've had this spring, we dropped all the way back to close to freezing at three inches in the soil. And the last couple of days of warm up, we are getting close back to the 50. I would say with the weather we're going to have over the next couple of weeks, we're going to stay in those low to mid 40s, which are a little, little below optimal for seeding. So it might be, like Pam was saying, those next couple of weeks would be optimal times if you're actually looking to put out seed. So I'm going to talk this morning about uh, some purpling you might be seeing. And the big thing is why we're seeing patches of purpling. So this is pretty common. You might see this this time of year in the fall where we see these purple patches on many of our turf grass, especially tightly mowed bent. And when we zoom in and look at the leaves, we see these purple pigments or the purpling on the leaves. These are from anthocyanin pigments. It's a misnomer that anthocyanins are always there and you're seeing purpling because chlorophyll is degrading. That's a misnomer. These pigments are accumulating under stress. So they're really not there on normal circumstances and they'll accumulate to high concentrations you'll see them pop out. But for us, why is it supporting? Why do we see segregation? Part of it's because these anthocyanins only accumulate usually under high intensity light. So this little part of this leaf was shaded and the anthocyanins are actually accumulating on this leaf blade when they're directly exposed to light. So some turf grasses under high light will produce them, some won't. And then we'll talk about some genotypes of turf grasses produce them, and some won't. And because some do and some don't, you get patches that have a purple and patches that don't, okay? So this time of year, these pigments are accumulated because some turf grass are actually intolerant to low temperature and high light, okay? It's that combination we're at 40 to 50 Fahrenheit, we got bright blue, sunny, sunny, sunny days. So these are creeping bank grasses either growing at 50 Fahrenheit, or 68 Fahrenheit. And, and we're going from high light intensity, which is 800 micromoles. This is kind of like, a, it's actually moderate light. We might see this light intensity around 10 or 11 o'clock this time of year. Then we have a 50% reduction of that, 400, and a 90% reduction at 100 micromoles. So 100 micromoles can be considered relatively low shaded light. So what you can see here is that these plants growing at 50 Fahrenheit under high light were purpling versus if we shade them, that purpling goes away. And what this tells us is that at this low temperature, it's the high light intensity that's driving the purpling. At 68 Fahrenheit, even at high light intensity, we weren't getting this purpling. So this combination of low light intensity, sorry, high light intensity and low temperature is what's causing these bent grasses to turn colors. But the question is, is why do we get segregation? This is a com common occurrence. This was out the OTF Research Center from a number of years ago, we see tiny little patches of purple. 
tiny patches of light green, tiny patches of purple. So why does this occur? This is because cultivars are made up of genetically different plants. So each plant you're seeing here started from an individual seed from the same bag of turf. Each individual seed is genetically different. They're called different genotypes. So a genotype being a genetically different material. So each seed, they're cousins, they're brothers. They're quite similar, but they're also quite different. And those slight differences in their genes can lead to differences that you see here. So these are individual genotypes of L93 creeping bent grass. This genotype A was quite purple under highlight. Type B didn't care at all, it stayed quite green. Type C here was kind of gray, but look how bushy it was. So these are individual genotypes that came from a single bag or a single population of that L93 keeping bed grass. Then we can look at how they respond to high light intensity. This genotype, SPL93A, it fried. This thing was pure purple under highlight. In shade, we get a, some of a reduction. So this genotype actually was purple under highlight and low light. We can look at this next one, FGL93D. Under highlight, it stayed relatively green. Then when we shade it, look what happens. It's nice succulent green. Next, SGL93A. Under high light, it's kind of suppressed, grayish green. Under low light, we're actually getting improved growth. So these different genotypes respond to light different, okay? And we can look at how they respond in turn of anthocyanin concentration. So this graph's looking at anthocyanin concentration across all of these different genotypes. So the larger the bar, the more anthocyanin pigment they were producing. So this one here, SPA, was producing the most under shade or highlight. This one down here, LPD, similar, but produced somewhat less. So you can see that we get segregation among these genotypes. Some of them produce lots of pigment, some of them produce very little. So out in the putting green, what you would see here is that these different genotypes produce these patches. So we have this genotype B here that produces a lot of anthocyanin. Genotype D actually is a light green genotype. Genotype C is a dark green genotype. And genotype A is somewhat in between. So the patches that we see are due to segregation because each seed is genetically different because of the way these plants are breeding. We'll never get populations of cool season turf grass that are homogenous. Kentucky bluegrass can be to some extent because it's what we call apomictic. We can talk about that maybe at a different, different point, but most of our cool season turf grass will always segregate like this. And they'll always segregate when we have these different environmental stresses. And that's all I got. I can tell you that was just plenty. All right, Dr. Petrella, with the science coming hard at it today, this man opens the door and lets the horses out. Uh, from my standpoint, folks, a couple of things. Uh, snow mold pressure, not too bad as far as what I've seen. Some activity, but we didn't have any extended periods of snow cover. I think for the most part, compared to the East Coast, we have avoided any winter kill or large amounts of winter kill. It looks like the, winter, the East Coast is uh, getting hit pretty hard. Uh, I have seen some red thread activity, but that's also on one specific site that um, is starving. Uh, and so that may be one of the reasons we've seen so much pressure there. Um, from the standpoint of uh, OSU activity and replacement positions, the committee has gotten together uh, in regards to replacing Dr. John Street. And so we're making progress there on candidates. Um, and then one other thing would be that remember, these will probably go for every two weeks until we get to maybe the middle uh, part of May, and that will be weather dependent. Um, and of course, we'll have various faculty members in and out uh, on each call. But try and uh, keep up with us. We're, we're always in the fast lane, or so we think. Um, and we will be posting these uh, every two weeks until we get to the middle of May. Thank you. We'll talk to you all soon. Thanks, folks.